Tonight, as we return to our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I want to direct your attention to chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. The apostle writes, There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all. Now, as you'll recall, in the first three chapters of this letter, the apostle has emphasized salvation. He has emphasized that in calling us to salvation, God has demonstrated his power. He doesn't just lay out the facts of salvation. His emphasis has been in the power of God. God has demonstrated his great power not only because he did something that no one else could do. He brought us to himself by giving us eternal life when we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but he did more. In addition to his great power in saving us as individuals, he gave life to us. That's regeneration, spiritual, eternal life, his life. God has also, folks, demonstrated his great power in our salvation by tearing down all racial barriers, all ethnic barriers between sinners so that he has made those who have come to believe in his son, Jesus Christ, one family and one body so that we are now brothers and sisters in Christ, one family. We share the same life of Christ coursing through us. We we have the same Holy Spirit who is within us. Paul, I invite you to look back at chapter 2, starting at verse 13. Paul taught us this. He said, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's talking about Gentiles, the heathen. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, meaning Jew and Gentile, into one. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. In other words, God took the laws that made Israel unique, and he set those aside in making the church so that Jews and Gentiles are no longer different in Christ. They're one new man. He established peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. That is the things that separated them, the differences between them. And he came and he, pe and he preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then... You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. He is assuring Gentile believers that you are just as much a part of the family of God as Jewish believers. And that is the power of God. Only God could do that. Only God could tear down that animosity. Paul will go on, and he did in chapter 3, to speak more of this. It's so important to him. He says in chapter 3, verse 6, to be specific, he's talking about what the mystery is. To be, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. But in, Now, that's chapters 1 through 3. But in coming to chapter 4, Paul turns from teaching strictly the theology, which is what he's been doing, of our oneness in Christ to calling us to practically behave in a way that reflects this oneness. By calling us to walk in a manner worthy of our salvation. And what he means by this is that we are to conduct ourselves in a way that corresponds to the oneness that we have been called to by the Lord when he called us to salvation. Notice chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you. It means I beg you, I beseech you, I appeal to you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And the specific way that God wants us to walk 
It begins with our attitudes, our attitudes. That those attitudes form the foundation for the way we live, the way we conduct ourselves. And so in verse 2, he lays out these attitudes with all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. And then he moves on to tell us in verse 3 that the goal and the purpose of these attitudes of humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, is that we would do one thing, maintain the unity that we have by the Holy Spirit having created the church. We already have this unity. He tells us to maintain it. Verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We need these attitudes to preserve the unity that's already there. And the reason for this and the basis for us to walk this way and the reason to preserve this unity is because everything about our Christian faith is founded on unity and oneness. Not division, not discord, not disagreement, not disharmony. This is why in the verses before us that I just read to you, verses 4 through 6, Paul repeats the word one seven times because he is arguing. He's arguing to make a point that the reason we should behave as one body, one family, in unity and harmony, is because everything about our faith is founded on this concept of oneness, not division. Now, we've already in past weeks looked at two of these ones, what I'll call ones, that Paul mentions. He says there is one body and one spirit. Concerning the one body, there is only one body of Jesus Christ, only one true church, he means. It's made up of all born-again believers. It does not reside in Vatican City. It is made up of all born-again believers. There are a variety of church denominations. There are churches that have they come in all kinds of flavors, all kinds of labels, but there is only one true body. We may attend, believers may attend, and we do, different local churches all over the world, but we make up one body, not many bodies, one body. Secondly, Paul says there is only one spirit, and the spirit he's talking about is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead or the Trinity, who dwells in each child of God, and who is in the process now of sanctifying each child of God. Although every believer has a distinct and different conversion story, if I invited you to share your testimony tonight, we would all have different stories, different aspects to it. But ultimately, while there may be some different twists and turns along the way, ultimately we, we all came the same way. We all came the same way to Christ. We all came the same way because the Spirit of God does the exact same work in every believer, everyone who becomes a believer. What do I mean by that? First of all, he begins by convicting us of our sin. No one has come to Christ without conviction of sin. Then he regenerates us. He gives us life. That's being born again. Then he places us into Christ. Paul calls that in 1 Corinthians 12, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes or places or immerses us in Christ. Having done that, then he begins the process of sanctifying us. Every Christian has this. No exceptions. He sanctifies us as he conforms us to the very character of Christ. So this work of the Spirit is the same exact work of the one Spirit in every single Christian. Now, tonight, we want to look at one more of the ones, the third of the ones that Paul mentions of our faith, as Paul lists the theological and practical basis for our unity. Next one that he mentions is that we have one hope of our calling, one hope of our calling. Verse 4, the end of it says this, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. Now, the apostle tells us that every believer in Christ shares the same hope. He calls this hope the hope of our calling. Now, the word hope, as it's used in the Bible, is very easy to misunderstand as one is reading the Bible or teaching it, because the modern 
usage of the word hope, especially in the English language, is very different. In fact, it is the complete opposite from the way it was used in the Bible. In today's English, the word hope is used in the sense of, I hope so. When someone says, well, I hope, hope it's a nice day tomorrow. Well, I hope so. It, it's a hope in, in something I desire to happen, but I have no certainty of it. It's more of a wish. It's just our desire. We're not certain about it. We're not sure about it. But this is something, if you ask me, I hope it happens. However, the word hope, as it's used in Scripture, is not a word of uncertainty. It's not a wish. It's a word of certainty. It's a word of assurance. It, it's, it's a word of conviction. For example, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the writer says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. See, the word hope is used here of expecting something to happen, of surety, of assurance, of conviction, of confidence, and it always involves the future. It's not a guessing game. It is something I know will take place in the future, something that we look forward to, and we know it will happen. That's precisely what Paul says every believer in Christ has in common. We all, he says, have, we all have one hope, we have the same hope, something we are all looking forward to happening in the future, and it pertains to our calling. He says we were all called in one hope of that calling. So what does he mean by this? Well, he says that our hope, which we now know has to do with the future, and is something that's going to take place in the future that we are sure will happen, it has to do with our calling. What calling is he talking about? It's a call to salvation. The call by which God calls you effectively and brings you to Jesus Christ for salvation. So what is it that God called us to that pertains to our future when he called us to come to Jesus Christ? Note this. When Christ called you to himself, he didn't only call you to be saved from the wrath of God. Now that's part of it flee from the wrath to come. But he also called you to come to him so that you would experience at, at some future date the ultimate point and aspect of your salvation. And what is that? Being perfected. Being glorified with Jesus Christ in heaven for all eternity. Our salvation is not just about here and now. It, it pertains to the future as well. Something we've not experienced yet. See, your salvation is not only about the forgiveness of sins. We love that. We're thrilled with that. We couldn't go to heaven without that. That's right now. But there is a future aspect to this salvation that, that you and I are looking forward to, to happening. And that is the day that we are taken home to glory. Being perfectly conformed at that moment to the image of Christ. This is what we all long for. This is what we are eagerly awaiting to happen, either by the rapture of the church, that's the snatching away of the church, or by death. And Paul has, has previously mentioned this to the Ephesians. Look back at chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. You'll see this is not something we have to guess at what he's talking about. He's already mentioned this. In chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, In him you also in Christ... You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that means when the gospel was proclaimed to you, you heard it, here's what happened. In, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, so they believed it, here's what happened. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. God not only gave you the Holy Spirit, he sealed you. You belong to him. The sealing is this unmarked, or I should say this invisible marking. It's unmarked in the sense that we don't see it, but it's an invisible marking that God has put upon us that we belong to him. He sees it. But notice, Paul says, who is given, meaning the Holy Spirit, as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of, of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. What does he mean by this? It means the moment that we were saved, the Holy Spirit sealed you. You're secure in him. You can never lose this salvation. You are sealed. 
As I said, the sealing is an invisible marking that God places upon us as his possession. And he's not losing any of us. And, Paul says, this, the Spirit of God, notice, verse 14, he's given us a pledge. He's given us a pledge. Not only does the Spirit of God seal us, he's the down payment. That's what pledge means. He's the earnest that more to come. He's the pledge. In other words, the Holy Spirit indwelling you is the foretaste of glory. It's the first installment of God's presence and fellowship guaranteeing us that we will receive all of his presence and fellowship in the future when we go to heaven. It's precisely what Paul means when he says at the end now in chapter 4, verse, or he says at the end rather in here in verse 14, notice this, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge, this guarantee in advance, that there is coming a day when we who already have been spiritually redeemed, purchased by the Lord, we will experience the fullness of that redemption. We haven't experienced it yet. We're still in these bodies, these fallen bodies. But someday, at death or the rapture, it's going to be changed. There'll be the, what Paul refers to as the fullness of our redemption, with a view to the redemption, he says, when we're in heaven, brand new, redeemed, perfect, glorified body. So now, now we go back, or we go ahead to chapter 4, verse 4, the end, and we see that what Paul is saying is that every Christian has this same calling. All of us, this one calling. It's the calling to be blameless and holy in the presence of Jesus Christ for all of eternity. And this, Paul says, is what ought to promote harmony and unity in the church. You have the same destiny. You have the same future. So the question we should be asking at this point is, how? How does this future hope of heaven help us to preserve unity amongst the brethren, amongst God's people, amongst ourselves right here and now? How does it do that? That's an important question to ask, especially in light of the fact that Christians are divided over their views of the future. I mentioned a number of weeks ago that Christians are divided on their views on the Holy Spirit, but they're really divided on their views concerning future events. It's known as eschatology, prophecy. There are believers who feel that the rapture, which I said is the snatching away of the church to glory, there are many believers who feel that this will take place before the tribulation begins. That's the pre-trib view. There are some who believe it will happen at the midpoint of the tribulation. They're known, that's known as the midpoint view for obvious reasons. Then there are some who think it will occur at the end of the tribulation, and you can guess what, they're, what that's, that's called as well. And there are some who even hold to a modified midpoint view, a mid-trib view. Then there are believers who hold to a future millennial Kingdom, a thousand-year future literal kingdom on earth of Christ. Others hold to no millennial kingdom. Some think that Christ will come prior to setting up his kingdom. Some see this as happening after the kingdom age. And listen, it goes on and on and on. Those are just some of the more popular views that Christians hold to when it comes to, to prophecy. There are all kinds of varieties that these views break off into. Listen, if you've ever studied or, or read the book of Revelation, and then tried to find out what it means by looking at commentaries, you know exactly what I mean. Exactly. There are so many different views on the book of Revelation, on prophecy. So, when it comes to the return of Christ and end time events, frankly, that's something that Christians are divided on. So, if that's the case, then how does this hope of being called to heaven in the future promote unity? That's what Paul says it does. Well, the answer is this. The apostle is not referring to the details of our views on prophecy. As I told you, the fancy name for that is eschatology. But what he's referring to is something that every Christian agrees, agrees on. And that is that we have the same destiny. We, we may not be in agreement on how that destiny unfolds, but we all agree 
that we have the same destiny, and that destiny is glory, and that we were called by God to this future glory. And this hope of the future, this future glory, it promotes unity. Let me give you two ways it promotes unity. First of all, this hope that we all have of glory forces us, if we take it to heart, to focus on eternity and our glorious future in heaven. And when you do that, what happens is the things of this world, which tend to only encourage arguments and disagreements and conflicts, the things that divide us, they fade away when you're focused on eternity. You're, you're, not, you're not really concerned that much about the mundane things of this world, even these disagreements, because you realize they're of no eternal consequence. In light of the fact that we are headed to heaven, we, we just shouldn't care about those mundane things. Yes, we can have disagreements, but we don't have to be disagreeable. People are so bothered by that, but in light of eternity, they mean absolutely nothing. The things that seem so important to us today will not be important in a million years, not even a hundred years, not even a year. No eternal consequence. And this is the point that the apostle was making with the Philippians. If you turn to Philippians chapter 4, I want you to see something. There were two women at the church, at the con in the congregation of Philippi, who were out of sorts with each other. They were out of harmony. They were at odds with each other. Notice what Paul writes. Starting in verse 2, he says, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche, that's the names of two women, to live in harmony in the Lord. Now, listen, the only reason the apostle writes that, live in harmony, and I urge you to do is because they were not living in harmony. He says, indeed, true com companion, so there was some specific individual in the church, probably one of the pastors, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Now, Paul wrote this to help these two ladies overcome whatever disagreement, whatever argument, whatever division they were involved in. He doesn't say what it is. They knew it. The church knew it. His true companion knew it. He wanted these ladies to be reconciled to each other, to live in harmony once again, and even told them how to do this. First, he said, you are to rejoice in the Lord. Notice he didn't just say rejoice. He said, rejoice in the Lord. That's a reminder of this incredible thing that has happened in our lives, that we are in the Lord, Amen. in a secure relationship, a relationship with him that, that promotes joy and fellowship and, and friendship. Rejoice in the Lord. Secondly, they were to have, he says, a gentle spirit. It's a forbearing, tolerant spirit, a spirit that puts others first, doesn't insist on their own, their own way, doesn't demand their right, yields its right to God and to others, it is the way of gentlemen and gentle women. And that's what they were not doing. They apparently were insisting on their own rights, and Paul says, just give it up. Esteem others more important than yourselves. And to help them to do this, Paul reminds them of a great truth. He says, the Lord is near. Now, we know that Jesus is always near to us because he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm always with you. And that alone should encourage us to live in harmony. But I take it that when Paul says the Lord is near, that what he means is that the return of the Lord is near. That Jesus could come at any moment, and his return is just getting closer and closer. And the reason that I, that I believe that this is what he's talking about is that context determines so much just prior, just a few verses prior to, what, uh, to writing about this, the Lord is near, he closed chapter 3 by talking about the return of Christ. You know, we have chapter divisions. Uh, the apostles didn't. That, was, that came later on. So this is just a few lines prior to this. Notice Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is 
is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the return of Christ. We're waiting for him to return. Who will, and, and here's the full redemption that, he's, that we went over, that he spoke about in Ephesians, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Now, it's right after this, just a few sentences later, that Paul says the Lord is near. He's returning, now the Lord is near. It's as if he is saying to Euodia and Syntyche, stop your bickering because the Lord is coming back soon. And whatever issue is causing you to have this conflict, it means absolutely nothing in the light of his return and eternity. Ladies, the Lord is near. Stop it. Folks, this is such an important truth. It's the fact that your destiny is heaven, and it's heaven for all of eternity ought to cause you to just stop and say, you know what? Arguing about petty things of this world, that's crazy. It makes no sense. They, it, it, they don't matter. What looks so big, what looks so significant now has no eternal ramification. As I said, what difference will your disagreements make in a million years, in eternity? The Lord is near. When he comes, eternity will begin for you. The hope of your calling will become a reality. So maintain peace, maintain harmony now because these divisions are just so petty, they're worldly, and they are inconsequential in light of eternity. Second way, second way that the hope of our calling promotes our unity and it discourages divisions is that it forces us to focus on what we are going to be in the future, not what we were in the past. What we are going to be saved to, not what we were saved from. See, if we look back at our past, you know what we, what we see? We see differences amongst ourselves. Distinctions, different races, different languages, different people groups, different cultures, different jobs, different educational levels, different financial levels, and it's these things that tend to divide us because these things are likely, very likely, to cause animosities, attitudes of superiority, attitudes of inferiority, conflicts. There are people who use these differences to think they are superior to others. I don't know if you saw it, but in the state of Washington recently, there was a uh, man who saw a husband and wife, mixed race, black and white, kissing in public, and he attacked them with a knife. And he said he was a white supremacist. White supremacist. Differences, distinctions we have now become warped in our thinking that we are better than others. If you have more money, you're superior to others. If you have a better job, you were born into a, a, a different race that you think is better than another race. You see, when we look back at our past, it only encourages conflicts, sinful attitudes of pride, animosity. Listen, that's exactly the problem that Paul was addressing with the Ephesians. Some of them were saved out of pagan Gentile backgrounds. Some were saved out of more moral Jewish backgrounds. And these folks hated each other because they were different from each other. But in Christ, and that's really the message of chapter 3 and chapter 2 and now into chapter 4, in Christ, those differences are put away. And we need to live as brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul reminds them, although you have different backgrounds, in Christ, you all have the same future. No one has a different future. We all have the same. Because in calling you to salvation, God called you to spend eternity with his son, Jesus Christ in heaven. And that's why you need to live in harmony now. Because you are all headed in the same direction, heaven. I remember reading the story. And I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that I mentioned this already to you in one of these messages. But it's so appropriate now. That the father of Matthew Henry, who went on to write a great devotional 
commentary. It's a name, a, a godly man named Philip Henry. And Philip Henry found and, and fell in love with what, what was to be Matthew Henry's mom, his mother, I forget her name, but she was of a different class. This is in England where back then the class system was very important. And Philip, Philip Henry was of a lower class. And this woman's father did, did not think that she should marry this man, thinking that we're, we're so much better. And she, he said to, to his daughter, where is he from? And his, and his daughter said, I don't know where he's from, but I know where he's going. Folks, that's, that's the unity we have. It doesn't matter where we're from. It matters where we're going. Listen, if you are a believer in Christ, then I urge you, don't look back at what you once were. No, I know for testimonies we, we say this, and it's good to be reminded of what the Lord has saved us from, but I wouldn't focus on that. It's not important. But what is important is what we look forward to, being glorified with Christ. And everyone who knows him is going to have the exact, we do have the exact same future. Glorified child of God. Because that is something you have exactly in common with every single believer, regardless of how young or old you are. Age doesn't divide us on this. How mature or immature in Christ you are. Maturity or immaturity doesn't divide us on this. How involved you are in serving the Lord. Maybe you're very active and maybe you're not that active. This doesn't change your future. How long you've been saved. It doesn't matter. You have the same destiny. It's the same hope of your calling. This future aspect of this glorious salvation. That's what ought to bring us together rejoicing. So yes, we, we hold to our doctrinal views on prophecy. But let's not let that divide us. Because one thing we agree on is we're going to be with him forever. If you've never trusted Christ, though, it really, the sad thing is, the horrifying thing, actually, is you have nothing forward and nothing to look forward to in the future. Your future is bleak. It is horrible. I would say it's terrifying without Christ because it is a future, the Bible says, of hell and eternal wrath. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. The Bible says, repent of your sin Turn to Jesus Christ and trust him to be your Savior and Lord. And you will be saved for all of eternity. And you will join other believers then in the same hope of your calling. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, thank you for calling us to such a great salvation. Lord, even as the psalmist we saw this morning says, you have done well to your servant, O Lord. According to your word, we say, you've done well to us, Lord. You've been so good to us to save us, to forgive our sins, to redeem us, and to give us a future, a future we look forward to, Lord. It's so easy to be too caught up in this world, too caught up in what's going on in politics, too caught up in what's going on in news events, what's going on in the culture and all of that. And, and Lord, certainly we need to be somewhat aware of these things, but help us. Help us to recognize that our citizenship is in heaven and that we have a glorious future. Help us to not focus on the mundane things of this world to the neglect of thinking about the future that awaits us, glory. Help our minds to dwell on the things above, Lord, not the things below. And I pray for anyone convicted of petty arguments and disagreements that, that seem so important now. I pray that they'll fade away as they think about the hope of their calling, the full redemption of these bodies. Lord, how, how we long to be with Christ, how we long to be delivered from the, the pains of earth, Lord. I also pray, help us, help us to focus more on where we're going and not where we've come from, and to never look down on others because of differences, Lord. We're all cut from the same cloth of sin. And so I pray, Father, for that, for believers, that thinking of the future will promote harmony and unity. But I also pray for those who may be here, may be listening or hearing this or watching this, who have never turned to Christ, may you open their hearts to the gospel. May they see clearly their sinfulness and their need to repent 
and trust Christ as their Savior before it's too late. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. Have a wonderful week, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Thank you.